Hello, hello. Wow, amazing. Um, I'm Peter Beanstock, and I, I help uh, organize the cuisine and, and culture series. Um, normally, uh, when we have a speaker, if I'm to introduce them, I uh, usually they've they've written articles or books on the subject they're going to talk about. So uh, I read those, and that helps me uh, introduce their subject. In this case, uh, Ray is publishing his memoirs in when? May? May 14th. Uh, and they are entitled Steal the Menu, a memoir of 40 years in food. And so I haven't read his book, but I have lived in his vicinity for 40 years. So I feel uh, I've lived the book, even if I haven't, haven't read it yet. Um, to give you a, a quick rundown of his remarkable career, um, he was the New York Times and New York Magazine uh, food critic at various points. Uh, he was a longtime uh, arts and leisure editor of the Wall Street Journal, retired in 2002, and then when the newspaper uh, was sold and opened a weekend edition, he came back in 2006 and was the uh, res restaurant critic of the weekend edition until 2010. Uh, and while he was doing all that, he found time to write a lot of books, wonderful cookbooks, uh, a novel, uh, a marvelous book about the exchange of food between the old and new worlds after 1492, uh, and some other ones. Um, the thing that fascinates me now is, uh, well, uh, Ray and, and Johanna live in a beautiful D Dutch stone house, 18th century house in Gardner, New York, very bucolic, surrounded by apple trees. And um, I was reading in the newspaper of record of Ul southeastern Ulster County, the New Paltz News, only a week ago, and I saw a headline that said, Ray Sokolov joins Gardner Planning Board. So I, uh, I read on, and uh, Turns out there was a place on the board, three candidates and three members of the town board. And so each candidate got one vote. And then the paper goes on to say, with three members voting for three different people, they had to do another straw vote. And in the end, voted unanimously for Sokolov. They congratulated him and thanked the other two candidates. So. <laughs> There is a kind of comity and decency in local politics in the Hudson Valley uh, if there's not further south in our, our country. So Ray is now, uh, this polymath, is now embarking on a new career as a public official uh, and a planner and a civic leader. Um, because we're at the Institute, um, I'd like to say something about Raymond's amazing uh, academic credentials. Uh, he graduated, uh, he was junior Phi Bay at Harvard, uh, graduated summa cum laude in classics, won the Bowdoin Prize for the best undergraduate thesis uh, in his graduating year. When, when I asked him about that, uh, he sent me an email with that information and then noted that everything since has been downhill. <laughs> um, but what's quite something is that after he's, his first retirement from the journal, he went back to Cambridge, found his advi PhD advisor, he had halfway, I guess, gotten through his PhD, um, who was now in his 80s and emeritus, finished his PhD uh, thesis in classics and received his doctorate at the uh, graduation in 2005 at the age of 63. So, uh, I am delighted and hope you'll join me in welping, welcoming Dr. Raymond Sokolov. Thank you, Peter. You're entirely too generous as usual. And in fact, I want to say that um, everyone here is, I think, um, being very generous by showing up tonight to hear God knows what, I'm not sure. <laughs> Me, uh, but I do want to say that um, I uh, wish I were a friend of the Institute for Advanced Study. I wish I had been many years ago because 
if I'd thought about it soon enough, I imagine that as friends, you have uh, an intimate connection with the institution and that I, if I had been a friend, I might, for example, have been able to go sailing on Lake Carnegie with Albert Einstein. <laughs> or uh, if I, or, or played, played bridge with J. Robert Oppenheimer and uh, fended off sharp comments from his notorious wife, Kitty. Or um, it goes on, I had a drink after work with um, John von Neumann and perhaps even met his age-appropriate daughter, Marina. <laughs> or perhaps, you know, been able to discuss my algebra problems in ninth grade with Freeman Dyson. <laughs> or, or, or his daughter, Esther. Who can say? Um, but I didn't do any of those things, and I, I have, I, I am friendly, I did study w at one time in, um, when I was in graduate school with an emeritus professor at the Institute, Glenn Bowersock, who remains a friend of mine, I mean a friend in the normal sense, not, and uh, the, uh, <laughs> and I, I won't flaunt my connection with the trustees, to, uh, two of whom uh, one of whom I had a very long association with. I didn't see him here tonight, but what can I say? He was always avoiding me when we worked together. Uh, <laughs> in any case, although I missed the boat on becoming a friend of the IAS, I would like to be a friend of all of you. And in order to do that, I should probably tell you a little bit about myself that um, has eluded eluded Peter and, and is in, uh, connects. First of all, let me explain this photograph, um, which was taken in the New York Times test kitchen in 1972 when I was 31. And uh, the, um, it was the beginning of things for me, but the end for Life magazine. And the photographer was the great Alfred Eisenstadt, who took the famous picture in Times Square on VJ Day and of the couple kissing, and um, nobody kissed during this photo session. I want to be clear about that. I didn't kiss Eisenstadt. My test cook, uh, Miss Hewitt, uh, Miss, um, Mrs. Hewitt, uh, kept a uh, discreet distance, scowling. And, uh, but the, the terrible, th the, uh, this picture, Eisenstadt sent me a print that he had made himself. Uh, so it was an object of great value, and uh, I foolishly lent it to the New York Times photo studio so that they could use it to make a house ad in the newspaper promoting me as their critic. And of course, one of the lab technicians understood what was in his hands, and he stole it. Um, meanwhile, it never appeared in Life magazine because Life folded, and then um, over a period of time, I would call up and say, can I use this on a book jacket or something? And they would quote a price that I think is known in, in the, in the uh, world of economics as market clearing. Um, it was so expensive, I just figured I, I couldn't afford it. And then, at a certain point, um, as my fortunes improved, I called and I said, I want a print of that. I'll pay anything. And they couldn't find it. Well, when this book came along, I thought, and, and very generously, my publisher, Knopf, said, we'll put in as many pictures as you're willing to pay for clearing the rights of. <laughs> and so, um, so I thought, this is one I really want. And um, then uh, I thought, I know how to get this. Because a man called John Huey, who was both a colleague and a friend, um, was, had the wonderful title of um, editor-in-chief of Time Incorporated. And I called him. We were modestly in touch over the years. And I said, John, I need this picture. I'll pay anything. And he then um, deputized a man who was in charge of the entire heritage of Life magazine. And that man went down into some Dickensian basement in the Time Life building and found the and complete contact sheet and negatives from, from the shoot, and the, it's a long and wonderful story of how I finally got to uh, buy a print made by an anonymous but, but careful person, and it's in the book, and there's my picture. Now, 
Um, the, the real question that should be puzzling you, it always puzzles me, is how it was that um, I started out uh, in Detroit and uh, where the most, the, 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 I never ate in the most important restaurant there growing up because my parents were too modest they, uh, to ever go to the most expensive place. So they went to the second most expensive place and mainly we ate in a place called Vanelli's, which I am the only living person who has any memory of this Italian restaurant. Uh, and I also used to go to a place that had no sign and uh, it was a, it looked like a, 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 a small railroad locomotive and a, a, a retired, uh, I think failed advertising executive named Bill Brooks lurked in the back and he had a, a microphone out in front so if you came there and pleaded with him and he felt like it, he'd let you in this place and it had a model railroad inside and um, he would, hamburgers would come out on the flat cars. <laughs> so those, that was the, the most interesting restaurant I ever ate in uh, before I went to college and then I spent most of my time um, trying to memorize the regular Greek verb and um, eventually I had some other experience, uh, experiences. I, I uh, worked abroad, I lived abroad on a Fulbright, so I began to understand and, and I also lived near Julia Child. Now, I don't believe that I could claim that I learned anything from her, even though we did share the Mass Avenue bus on several occasions. <laughs> and um, when I felt flush, I would use her butcher, Jack Savinor, um, who got in a lot of trouble for putting, um, for weighing, um, for f giving false weight. Um, and, uh, but, I found another life picture of Julia with Jack Savinor that uh, Lee Lockwood took for life and I did clear the rights for that too. And anyhow, um, so I had these not very interesting food experiences and, uh, but I got more and more interested and then I was working at Newsweek. And a friend of mine who um, is the, uh, the only person ever fired from Newsweek for um, lack of performance. He'd, didn't, he was a writer and he didn't write anything for 18 months. <laughs> um, so you could say that he um, had made a mess of his own career, but he went out and changed mine completely. He had worked at the New York Times in a very junior capacity and someone told him the Times was posting uh, Craig Claiborne's job on the Union Bulletin Board, which is kind of a joke, but they were required to do that. And, and um, so, um, Alex said to me one morning, coming in, um, looking depressed as usual, he said, I have great news for you. You could replace Craig Claiborne, just call them up. And I laughed at him and went back to re reviewing a book, which was mainly what I did there. And, um, but Alex went about single-handedly staging the rest of my life. He, he, <laughs> he, he knew that our mutual friend Paul Zimmerman was a social friend of the women's editor of the New York Times, the legendary um, acerb Charlotte Curtis. And um, Paul uh, called her up and because I had planned Paul's summer vacation in terms of restaurants I knew about, he thought of me as a master gastronome. And he told Charlotte that and Charlotte, you know, they were trying to find someone no one had ever heard of to replace Claiborne and I certainly qualified on, on, that, on those grounds. <laughs> And Paul came in one morning and he, looking cheerful as he always did, and he said, uh, you know, I've mentioned you to Charlotte Curtis about the Claiborne job and if you um, uh, are interested, you should call her up. And I thought, you know, I'd really like to meet her. What's the harm? And, uh, you know, it's all a joke anyway. So I called her up and she said, wow, in this nasal Akron accent that she had, she, she said, um, meet me for lunch at the Cote Basque, which at that time was at the top of most, or near the top of most people's lists of French restaurants in New York when French restaurants were where it, where it was at. So I met her there. And um, she was in a uh, Chanel suit with her um, hair pulled tightly back in a bun. And we were seated right at the door which was where you wanted to be seated because in those days, um, 
expensive French restaurants were basically about their seating plan. And if, uh, uh, I mean, if you were seated right in the front door, everyone coming in could see you. And if you were way in the back in Siberia, the restaurant didn't have to worry if they saw you. So we were seated at table A1. And I looked back just to see what it looked like from that perspective in the coat basque. And four tables back in the increasing gloom were Catherine Graham, the owner of Newsweek through the Washington Post Company, and Kermit Lansner, who was the executive editor. And I really didn't want them to see me having lunch <laughs> with Charlotte Curtis. Since, uh, so we had lunch, and then uh, the gossip columnist Leonard Lyons came over with his notebook <laughs> to see who was this young man with Miss Curtis. And we tried to give him no information at all, and then a woman at the only circular table, which was a table for six, and she was sitting alone with a turban and an audible Romanian accent, um, sent us a bottle of expensive Chardonnay to celebrate, as, as the waiter explained, whatever we were celebrating. <laughs> I will tell you um, that we did not discuss the food and restaurant editor job at the New York Times for one microsecond at that lunch. We had a lot of other things to amuse ourselves with, I guess, I can't remember. And then she said, I could drop you on the way back to your office in the cab. And um, you know, I was only three or four blocks from my office, but I thought, well. So I got in the cab, and during that short passage, she said, you could have this job, you know, if you want it. <laughs> <laughs> but since you've never written anything about food at all before, which was not quite true, but at any rate, um, essentially, she said, we'd like you to do three tryout pieces. We'll pay you for them, and it was a very good price, and we'll cover your expenses, and no one will know, and, we, and if you're hired, we can publish them, and if you're not, you can uh, take them home and uh, put them in your scrapbook. <laughs> and I thought, this is too good to pass up. <laughs> They're going to buy me dinner. And all I have to do is write eight or nine hundred words three times, which, you know, that was what I did. So I, it didn't at all phase me, the idea. And it could be total junk, in, because I knew that once they read what I had to say about food, they'd find someone better. Well, I wrote them, and uh, then, uh, and in fact, one of them uh, was, the, the uh, setting for it was, only a few minutes from this room, on Route 1, in, a, uh, in the dining area, if you could call it that, of a BP gas station run by a, couple of Ch a, a Chinese couple from Sichuan province, a place no one had ever heard of before, except my friend, the Princeton historian, John Schrecker, who uh, knew all about Sichuan food because he had, or, uh, he had lived in Taiwan at where that the food of that, the peppery food of that province was already uh, the rage as refugees from Mao were coming to, uh, from all regions and opening restaurants in, in Taipei. So he found it and said, you got to come here. And, and we went and I wrote a little piece about it, which created pandemonium and wrecked the restaurant when I was hired and I finally, and I had to publish this piece the first day I was there because Claiborne, uh, the old fox, decided to decamp the very day that I came for work. But we had lunch before he left. Charlotte and Craig and I went to the New York Times cafeteria, <laughs> a place I really could appreciate coming from the gastronomic scene in, in southeastern Michigan. And, and, <laughs> the, the, uh, and we sat there, and, and, um, and so I said, Mr. Claiborne, I'm, I'm uh, 29 years old, and I don't know anything about this. What advice can you give me? And he said, oh, you'll figure it out, he said. There's just one thing. He said, it's important to know you have to steal the menu. I, sa I said, why? He said, well, you know, there's so much information in it, and you'll just waste your life calling up restaurants and getting them to dictate to you how much the, uh, you know, riz de veau financière uh, cost, or um, you know what what the special of the day you were there was, and you know it's all in the menu. So you want to steal? You have to steal the menu because 
you know, may, if you ask for it, maybe they'll give it to you and maybe they won't. And if they don't want to give it to you, they're going to be watching you. So you'll never get it out of there. <laughs> so, so here's what you do. You take the menu and when you think no one's looking, you put it in your lap. And if you don't get any flutter of attention, then you fold it up and put it in your pocket or in your briefcase. He said, you know, it might look like you were playing with yourself under the table. <laughs> but a waiter, a waiter will never bother you about that. <laughs> so that's, that's, why, that's why my memoir is called Steal the Menu. And I want you to, that is the only piece of information. That's the take home lesson from today. And you won't hear about that again. Uh, so I became the food editor of the New York Times at, at, at a, um, at a for, from 1971 to 1973, and um, the, it was a period of, um, it was a dismal time to be a restaurant critic. Um, at the heart of it was um, a, m a kind of trough in the American economy, somewhat brought on by um, the Nixon administration's wage and price controls, which had a flattening effect on people's interest in, um, in trying new ventures. And, but I think really the problem was that an era was coming to an end, an era that had started in the 1939 World's, 30, 1940 World's Fair, someone must know, but at any rate it was it, 39. And, and um, while the, the, the French pavilion at the World's Fair was run by someone called Henri Soulet, and it was called Le Pavillon Francais. And he couldn't really, he didn't want to go back to France um, after Hitler was in, in the process of invading his country, or uh, it certainly Poland by then. So he stayed. And he had many offers of backing and opened Le Pavillon, which for the next 30 years, I guess, uh, more or less, was, was the most admired restaurant in New York City and also a, a place that, um, whose social values, um, I, in, I never ate there during his time or saw him, but it, uh, th they didn't particularly appeal to me. And, it, you know, if you had really spent time in France after, significantly after the post-war recovery, what they were doing and the clones that spun off from that restaurant, which were also at the pinnacle, were places that, um, would never have gotten um, a Michelin star in Paris. And they were overpraised and had, as I was telling you, you know, a kind of, were based in, th their main principle was cultivating a, a very limited clientele. And so for a young, um, uh, unimpressible gastronome, <laughs> if that's what I was, you, um, it just didn't work. And what I did know was that there was one restaurant I really liked, and um, it didn't, it only had two stars, in the, or whatever the second highest ranking in the Times was under Claiborne, and that was Lutece, which really felt like a wonderful French restaurant that probably would have gotten two stars in Paris, I thought, as a, as a customer. You know, I would occasionally go there, and it was a wonderful place. So one of my goals was to give the highest ranking to Lutece and be as, you know, um, slighting as I possibly could to all of the places that reflected the spirit of, of the, the dead hand of Henri Soule. And I didn't really have to do much of that because they all started closing. And, for, and, and um, I don't have a theory really as to why, except that I think the world had moved on. And uh, Lutece, of course, flourished for uh, several decades thereafter and was generally regarded by people after a moment or two of thought um, as the outstanding restaurant in the United States. Um, well, uh, so it was an interest, a really interesting moment, but for the first year or so, was a little frightening because there was no place to, re uh, places of consequence were not opening. And if you're a critic, you want to go to new places. I mean, if you're a theater critic, you have no problem because plays are opening all the time. Books appear, uh, you know, by the thousands. But restaurants, it, now, you know, in our era, they're opening every minute. But in 1971, um, I found myself uh, re-reviewing old places because, 
there was no place you could really want to recommend, that, not too many anyway, that were opening, until uh, the, the phenomenon that I had noticed first here in, uh, what county are we in? Mercer? Mercer? Yeah. Is, is Route 1 still in Mercer County? <laughs> yes. In Mercer County, I'm sorry, I mean my grasp of the New, it used to be better, my grasp of the county map of New Jersey. I, uh, but at any rate, in Merc here in Mercer County, um, the, the phenomenon, at least on the east coast of Sichuan food, was, it was one of, the, one of the birthplaces of the American Sichuan food world. But there was a man who had come over, um, the Immigration Reform Act of, I think, 1967, uh, which uh, was one of the two or three most, uh, most important pieces of legislation of that time, uh, opened up um, immigration to people from, uh, from Asia. And so all of a sudden there were people who were not the descendants of Cantonese railroad laborers, uh, three or four generations from China. They were young, interesting people who really wanted to be restaurateurs and knew something about it. And they began this revolution that we live in today of um, expert, authentic, regional Chinese food. And most of these places did not open in Chinatown either. And the man who was most crucial in this, who um, uh, David, uh, I think he would say ge, but we all said K, K-E-H, the way he spelled it, was a, a dishwasher at a place on Maiden Lane in the financial district that was called the Four Seas. By, leg by Chinese legend, there are four oceans. And so anyway, the, the owner was a shipping, a Chinese Brazilian shipping magnate who really liked um, northern and Sichuan food. And he opened this place. It was briefly very fashionable, then it burned down. But David Kay remembered uh, uh, that there was real potential there. And he's, he opened, um, he kept opening Sichuan restaurants more and more in different places. And all of a sudden, this was something that you really wanted as a, as a restaurant critic. New places, new exciting things you could you know, learn about, explain to people. And um, so I really dived into that. And I think it, um, my lack of interest in the traditional four-star restaurants and my perhaps over-enthusiasm for some of these made, made um, um, perplexed my ultimate boss, uh, A.M. Rosenthal, uh, who uh, was, uh, he and I were not uh, soulmates. <laughs> and, and he once did put his arm around me, but I, I shuddered, and I think he sensed that. Um, the, the, uh, at, at, at any rate, um, there was a lot of consternation about what was I doing, and then, um, then I decided I wanted to get out of there because I had, um, I had done the two, th I forgot to tell you that I also, for, for the English-speaking world, discovered the Nouvelle Cuisine, not at all intending to. Um, I just want, I, they finally let me go to Europe as their critic in, uh, I guess, seven, in the spring of 72. And I hooked up with my old Newsweek photographer friend, Jack Nisberg, who had l gone to France in the, uh, with the GI Bill, studied photography, never left, also never learned to be a very good photographer, <laughs> but he had a real grasp of what was going on in France. So he said, I said, I want to go to Bocuse, because I had heard about Bocuse even when I was working there for Newsweek in the late 60s. And, but I, you know, I just thought it would be a, a place, I had no expectation that anything particularly revolutionary was going on there. And Jack said, I'll go down there with you, but since it's the week between Palm Sunday and Easter, you have a shot at getting into the really interesting place, which only seats about 23 people, and it's in a grotty suburb of Paris called Anier, and the man running it uh, is, um, now of course, you know, I'm having a senior moment here, but uh, the, uh, <laughs> God. Well, um, <laughs> who can tell me who the chef owner of, of, of the uh, great restaurant in Eugenie? Uh, thank you very much. And there, there'll be a, a special a special snack for you afterwards. <laughs> the, yes, Michel Gerard, whose daughter, I mean, I really, 
whose daughter Eleonore now runs his empire. He's in his 80s, but still there, um, was running a tiny little place. And I went there, and it was simply astounding what, what, what they were serving. And um, all of it looked kind of traditional, but then you'd look again. And there was something clever about it, a joke, a metaphor, things you, you would never see in quite that way. And I knew a lot about what was in conventional luxury restaurants in that country at that time. And this wasn't it. So I got to write, and then I got on the train to go to Lyon to, to eat at Bocuse, and some traveler had left a, the, the Rhone regional version of L'Express, the news magazine, on, on the seat next to me. And it had Bocuse on the cover. And it said, you know, Jeune Turc or something like that, you know, revolution in the, in the, in the kitchen. And there was all, the phrase nouvelle cuisine had not yet been coined, but, but it was clear from this very good article that something remarkable was going on. In, um, in French kitchens by chefs who had all trained in another restaurant in Vienne, uh, run by someone called Fernand Poin, who was long, de long deceased. But so I went to Bocuse, and we had the classic experience that many, many other journalists had after me. He took me out in the, mor in the morning, and we went to the market, and I had a, a snack with him in this um, bouchon, a, a, a kind of saloon, uh, restaurant where people would go for in, in the middle of the day and his mistress was behind the counter and it was all, all very jazzy and I eventually wrote this article uh, 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 declaring that a revolution was going on in France and nobody paid any attention, you know, except for Clifton Daniel, the uh, husband of Margaret Truman who had been deposed as executive editor of the Times. God knows why. He was very, very talented and uh, he, he was, the only thing he, he was doing was running a radio program on WQXR every day where he would scoop the next morning's times because he had all of the, the material that was going to be in the paper. And he, if he thought you, you had written a really good article, he would bring you on his show. He found me in the middle of the night in, in my hotel room in Paris and interviewed me um, I was, uh, about, about this article because he was really interested in food and knowledgeable. So at least Clifton Daniel got the point. And, but it took some years before the rest of America caught up. And, but of course, then other things happened. And by then, um, Mr. Rosenthal and I decided we were not going to have to look at each other ever again. And we reconsidered later on. And I continued to have a, a kind of a freelance life at the Times. But I went out and uh, did various things, but the important one um, was uh, through uh, a Michigan contact I didn't know I had. It was a gruff uh, kind of um, natural naturalist who was the editor of Natural History magazine, uh, where, which had a huge circulation among almost all my New York friends who had been given subscriptions when they were school children. It was the publication of the American Museum of Natural History and uh, came out every month, and um, its most famous contributor was probably Margaret Mead. And um, Stephen Jay Gould uh, uh, and I were the parentheses between which all the articles about furry animals and um, other, other issues that uh, interested the, uh, the Museum of Natural History. And um, my job, uh, Alan Turnus, the editor, um, had this brainstorm, he thought that um, they should do a food column because um, it, the, uh, under the umbrella of food, most of the science that the museum was interested in could be focused on. And um, so I you know, started doing, I thought, anthropology. You know, food and, and, and culture would be what I'd do. And I made the mistake of um, writing a column about cannibalism, <laughs> wh wh which included, a, they, all, they wanted me to have a recipe at the end of each one. <laughs> and so for this one, I found a really snooty, classic French recipe called pain de cervelle. And it's a kind of quiche with brains, I guess. And, and um, so I changed in the ingredient list I wrote. I mean, the, uh, the point of the, of the column was, what, what were the, which cuts taste better? And how would you determine? I mean, obviously, I didn't, you know. But, but I read the ethnographic literature on cannibalism. And eventually, 
a consensus emerged that fingers really were the cut you wanted. It was a kind of early case of buffalo wings, I think. <laughs> at, at any rate, I wrote this column. And, uh, and, and uh, the recipe, uh, I substituted in the ingredient list for one and a half pounds uh, calves' brains. I put in brains of any higher mammal. <laughs> so they published this, and with an illustration, it was the classic woodcut made supposedly by an eyewitness in the bushes, he showed himself, watching while these Tupinamba tribesmen in the central Amazon ate a missionary. It was the ultimate New Yorker cartoon with the missionary in the pot, except it was a historic, you know, purported to be a historic, anyway, this thing ran. And the editor called me a, a little while later and he said, I'd like to have lunch. <laughs> this is a first, you know, in, in years there I had, he had never offered me lunch. And so we met in a truly awful place near the museum and um, he said, anthropology is not a real science after all, it's just soft <laughs> social science. Why don't you do botany? That's a hard science, you know. <laughs> and most food is plant food and is, is made of plants anyway. So there's much more variety. I said, I don't know anything about botany. <laughs> he said, how hard can it be? <laughs> Think of all those people who grow roses. You know. <laughs> how smart are they? And I said, much smarter than I am. I said, I said no, no, do botany. So I did, you know, and I, I, I never got very technical about it, but um, I became, I, after a while, I, re I began getting requests from rural Czechoslovakia, as it then was, from real botanists asking for reprints of my articles, you know, yeah. <laughs> explaining why the yam was not a sweet potato, things like that. <laughs> and and uh, th they, um, so I began to think, well, I'm in, I'm in a field, I guess, and what is that field? And uh, there, uh, there was a name for it, in fact, economic botany. Um, uh, it, which is a, f a fancy way of saying plants in human affairs. And it even had its own journal called Economic Botany. And I went through the entire run of its history and found nothing that was of any possible interest to me. So I continued. And at a certain point, uh, Turner said, um, come have lunch, I have an idea. So I went and he said, you know, all over this country, um, heritage food, things that, uh, um, foods and food ideas that were there with the pioneers or that they invented, they're, they're dying out. So why don't you go all over the country and we'll give you a photographer and, and uh, you find some of these and write about them before they disappear altogether. So, you know, I started doing that and, um, you know, middle 70s and I found uh, lots of these things, that were wonderful foods that would not seem they wouldn't seem to you now as though they were particularly recherche because sort of midway between this project, while I was saving American heritage food, other shrewder people were exploiting it um, in restaurants and created what they called the Nouvelle uh, cu American Cuisine, which it wasn't really, in, and it was something that they, they were doing in their, uh, uh, for another day, but at any rate, I. I discovered that I was actually writing about this very interesting phenomenon, which was um, old-fashioned food that had been basically created during a, a kind of yeasty moment when people would be in a pioneer situation and they had the old ideas from Europe in their head of what to eat, but none of the uh, ingredients, not the right ingredients or not the right appliance for doing it, and so they became um, creative. and. Uh, the, the best one I found was in Utah, the Utah scone, which is very much like an Indian fry bread, except that by then it had come, become in this pattern I was describing, exploited commercially in a chain of fast food restaurants called scone cutters and all over the, the metropolitan Salt Lake. And, um, the, you know, I was able to trace the history of it to Navajo fry bread and sopipillas, which, but these had yeast in them and, and were clearly the result of some Mormon missionary's wife improvising um, as between uh, what she would have called a, a scone and, and what her Indian, new Indian convert friends were making. And this, so that was an example of the kind of thing. And eventually it became a book. And um, the whole country, I think, not particularly because of me, but um, 
the, uh, there was a movement, of, uh, and again, as a journalist, I, was, I had somehow fallen into um, writing about it. Well, uh, the, uh, by this point, um, I, I really needed a, another job because my children, my two children were in fee-paying schools and I was doing all right as a freelance journalist, but when I got a call from uh, a man who, well, I, uh, who was then the kind of assistant to the CEO of Dow Jones, but who I had known on the Harvard Crimson, um, he called me up, he said, um, we need someone to edit our magazine Book Digest. Would you like to consider that? So this man who is, I believe, a trustee of the IAS, Peter Kahn, um, you know, was someone I had known uh, when he was the city editor of the Harvard Crimson. And the city editor of the Harvard Crimson was traditionally a person who had not been elected president of the Crimson. And it was just a kind of consolation prize. But Peter used it to get a patronage summer job running a dump truck for the city of Cambridge. <laughs> and it was, it was a forecast of things that would happen to him. He would win the Pulitzer Prize. He would become CEO for many, many years of Dow Jones and run the Wall Street Journal. But at that time, he uh, was in the kind of not running anything. And, but he had sat in on these discussions, how could they find someone to run this dreadful magazine, Book Digest, which they had paid $10 million for and been cheated by a magazine broker who had cooked the books and fooled them. And, the, and, and one of the things he had fooled them about was the founding editor of Book Digest, which was like the Reader's Digest, but for books, you know, and really cheesy because what they were buying were so-called second serial rights. First serial rights, that's interesting. The New Yorker, bought, serial means in a, in, a mag, in a periodical. And first serial rights, the New Yorker buys first serial rights. Second serial rights, and, the, and they are periodical publication before book publication. Second serial rights are after the book is published. <laughs> and they don't cost much. <laughs> and they have no class. Uh, the only steady buyer of, uh, besides Book Digest, uh, of second serial rights was, at that time, the New York Post. This was before Murdoch. He was too shrewd to continue with that policy. So, um, so I agreed readily. Oh, so I, I took the job. And uh, I was suddenly a you know, solvent, middle-class person with an office in, a, 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 in the Heckscher building over, over, uh, overlooking at 7... 35th, 5th Avenue and 57th Street, overlooking Bergdorf's with a clear view of the Metropolitan Museum so I could check out whether my wife was actually going to work or not. <laughs> and um, so I had a very good time, but I knew they were going to fold this magazine. And eventually, um, Peter s called me and said, um, we're folding Book Digest. Now that you've wrecked our magazine, maybe you'd like to see what you can do to our newspaper. So I <laughs> eventually went there. And, but I continued doing the natural history column while I created this arts page, uh, and which I did for 19 years. Um, and then, anyway, uh, my time in the food world was, I mean, I, I was able to stay current because I had an expense account and I needed to take writers to lunch. So I had a very good time in that way and I continued doing books. But the, when that came to an end because, um, well, you know, the journal was losing a lot of money and uh, they saw that someone less well paid than I was could probably do a fairly okay job and so I was bought out, and I did my PhD thesis, um, which I w um, am I running over? All right, I'll tell you one story about that. Um, it wasn't clear to me that 35 years a after I had dropped out that my credentials would be uh, fungible at the Harvard Classics Department. So I called him up, and the secretary said, I have no idea. And called the registrar. So I called the registrar, and they said, we'll send you, sure, they said, um, we'll send you the uh, form, uh, the readmission form. And uh, they, they, uh, it was one page. And 
I had to pay, you know, the, the wealthiest university in, in the world, um, I had to pay them $3 with a paper check sent by snail mail to their archives division for my graduate record with their seal on it sent to me, which I then had to mail back to another division of the same <laughs> university by snail mail. So I, I did that. And they also wanted, um, they said, you know, there's a, there, you'll have to pay uh, $500 for each semester you didn't register since 1965. <laughs> I said, that's really a lot of money. He said, don't worry, there's a cap of $1,000, I said. <laughs> See, this, this whole thing was, they imagined that people who would drop out of graduate school and then want to come back had had a drug problem or wanted to explore exotic sex in the Far East for a year or something like that. Not someone like me. <laughs> and anyway, I sent the thousand dollars that the real problem was to find someone in the department to write a letter of recommendation. And they were all dead, <laughs> the ones who had known me, except for Wendell Vernon Clausen, my original thesis advisor, who was still around, as Peter said. And um, he wrote an enthusiastic letter, and I was in, and I eventually wrote the thing. Then I got a call from this guy who said, we need a restaurant critic for uh, Journal Weekend and um, the, uh, or Pursuits, it, that section was then called. So I came back and then something truly interesting happened. So I didn't have any idea what the restaurant scene in this country had become. And I will tell you that they didn't want me writing about New York restaurants because they, of course, were a national newspaper and it would have looked kind of funny if I was only writing about New York. So I went on the road and I went everywhere and uh, found places in, I mean, a place called Heartland in St. Paul. It sounds like a joke, but it was a wonderful restaurant. And I w kept finding them everywhere. You could hardly go to a city in America that didn't have what I came to call a national uh, kind of restaurant, something that anybody who came from any kind of place would be happy to eat in. So that became my job. And I went around and saw what was going on, in, especially in Chicago, where, you know, th th those remarkable restaurants, but in all sorts of, uh, you, I found um, in Des Moines, in, in, in Milwaukee, you could go anywhere. It was like finding heritage food that, that hadn't disappeared yet. It was, it was happening and still is in the most wonderful way, as um, those of you who probably travel more than, than I ever did will know. However, in the meantime, the last thing I want to mention just for completeness is I began to notice um, there were restaurants which were like uh, very elaborate laboratories. And I went to all of them, uh, from El Bulli, now, now not open, where uh, my wife nearly expired, from a dish which looked like um, a, an ice cream cone with some white material in it that turned out to be pulverized popcorn, which she aspirated and um, went into a coughing fit over. And But it was a, a fabulous restaurant. We went to the Fat Duck. Anyway, this is a, a phenomenon which to end the, the, my whole, uh, we went, we managed through a peculiar connection to get into the, um, the Noma, the restaurant uh, in Copenhagen that, that uh, serves um, seaweed and other things foraged from the uh, uh, forests and ponds of Scandinavia. And um, uh, at any rate, I, so I wrote about them and uh, and a similar neo-Nordic place in, in Reykjavik. There was, it was a wonderful assignment. And now I'm on the planning board of Gardner, New York. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've, written, I've, <laughs> I've written all of this in as much detail as I could manage. And um, the, if you have questions, I'm here to answer them as best I can. Thank you. Thank you very much. You don't want my view on the sequester? <laughs> Why? <laughs> you, you know, I, I went to Obama's, uh, when he, the first campaign, they had me go to the hometowns of the two candidates and to eat in their favorite restaurants. And um, 
they wouldn't tell me. The, campaign, the Obama campaign refused to tell me, and I had to do all this, you know, investigative reporting to discover where, where Michelle ate and things like that. And I, uh, um, but that's all I know about national politics. <laughs> Actually, I have no questions. We could have dinner. Uh, one, one question here. Yes, sir. Um, many of us who have lived in this area feel that Princeton is kind of a minimum in terms of quality and quantity of good restaurants. That is, you can go in any direction from here in the restaurants get better, and we wondered if, I wondered if that was your experience uh, I think as well. Well, I mean, uh, I went, to, what was the name of the place where we had lunch, or is that not still there? <laughs> that was pretty good. Um, I have no idea, because when I'm here, I eat with friends at home. So I, I you know, um, I have not the slightest, if, if there was a secret, you would know about it. That's what I figure. Why wouldn't you know? Uh, why, how, how would it be possible that you would be unaware of a fabulous restaurant in, at your doorstep? I, I just don't, you know, I, I, I don't think. There's a place near me that requires three or four years to get a seat at. <laughs> a and um, someone told me about it, and I, uh, you know, I sent in my request, and it's been two years, I haven't heard. <laughs> so and that's sort of a secret, but I don't think, frankly, Yes. San Fernando Valley. Good place to eat. Yeah. I haven't been there since I was nine. <laughs> I ran away from my grandfather's home. I was so bored. Uh, he, no, he lived in North Hollywood, actually. Is that? That's exactly where I. Well, then you should go back and you know let us let us all know. Take take names and addresses. <laughs> all right. Thank you.